Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Nick Tulo, streaming live from New Jersey for my Saturday morning clinical live stream. My uh, YouTube channel is um, ECG Doc, and if you enjoy this content, please subscribe. There's a button below. Let all your friends know that I am a cardiac electrophysiologist, and I just love ECGs, and that's why I'm here on a Saturday morning I'm practically in my pajamas, yes, not robe and slippers, but close enough to try to show you some interesting cases and teach you more about ECGs than you ever thought you'd learn. So this is going to be fun. This is a really cool case of a patient that was in the recovery room and they called me that there was some something crazy going on with her ECG. So... Um, I hope that um, you're enjoying all this and um, uh, we'll get to the case right now. So this was a 60 year old woman and she had just had an, a total abdominal hysterectomy and she had no prior history of any heart problems, no hypertension, no diabetes. She never knew if she had coronary disease, she never had an event, never even saw a cardiologist. And she was always told that her electrocardiograms were normal in the past. And in fact, what I'll do is show you her baseline ECG, and um, it's right here. So this was pre-op, and uh, as you can uh, see, hopefully on your screen, that uh, she has a normal sinus rhythm, 300, at a rate of about 70 beats a minute or thereabouts with normal looking P waves. And um, let's see, the um, she has a, kind of an intermediate axis, um, uh, it's um, small in, um, in uh, 2, 3, and AVF, and largest in lead 1, so it's um, probably uh, about plus 15 degrees or so. I'm not going to get too bogged down with calculating axis, but when you look at the precordial leads, there's a normal R wave progression, and uh, everything looks fine. She was uh, cleared pre-op. I guess the only thing that I would notice is that her QT interval is a little bit long. Well, you know, you can kind of tell if you look at the R to R intervals and if the T wave goes past the midpoint between the two R to R intervals, that's usually a sign that there's something going on. And so, um, and so that's kind of how you m might want to calculate that. But in her case, I didn't make much of that. Looking at, uh, oh, good morning, everybody. I see a few people have signed in. Wyatt, Nicola, uh, Kel from Norway. Thank you so much. And Ricardo Vierelli, buongiorno. So <laughs> thank you very much for joining me. Um, I have this core group of people who, who uh, kind of sign in and let me know they're watching, which is really cool. It looks like there are about 15 people watching now. So if you have any questions or something, put them in the chat. I will try to get to it. I'm not that good at looking over at the chat because it's on another screen here, but we'll go on with this case. So the QT is a little bit long, but you know, I didn't, nobody picked it up and uh, she wasn't on any medications, had no history of syncope or anything. So anyway, the nurses noticed that suddenly on her monitor, she looked like she had a C elevation. And they were very concerned because she was a little sedated, but was awake and she had no complaints at all but they saw this ST elevation, they were monitoring, I think, lead three. And ST elevation was pretty remarkable. I looked at it on the monitor, it was pretty impressive. And uh, we were, um, good morning, Anna. Thank you for, for coming in. And Katrin, thank you for, for joining us in this discussion. If you guys have questions, please post them. So the, she was perfectly fine, but you look at her monitor and she had this ST elevation. So of course, Everyone was concerned. They, um, uh, they, they, they were ready to, they, actually they, they wrote the order to, for cardiac enzymes and they were gonna get a stat echocardiogram and they called cardiology, you know, right away to do a consult. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I have, uh, this is only my, my fourth cup of coffee this morning. So, yeah, you have to forgive me. So, what would you do? What would you do when you got there? Well, of course, you know, they did all the right things. They get the history and all that. But when I walked up, I saw this ST elevation and then it seemed to go away. I mean, not 
over the course of a minute or two, but immediately. It was almost like it was coming and going. I was like, did you guys get another cardiogram? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we, we did. Um, and so when I looked at the cardiogram, this is what I found. And if you look um, at V1, I'm sorry, if you look at the, 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 the standard leads, um, one, two, three, RLF, it looks exactly the same as it did before. Where's my cursor here? Okay, so it looks like a same normal sinus rhythm. Everything looks the same. But look at V1 and V2. Now you have um, Q waves. Q waves, it's like a QS pattern, and you have ST elevation that wasn't there before. Isn't that crazy? But it's only in V1, V2, V3. The rest of the leads look fine. So what do you make of that? Anybody? Oh, oh, oh. Good evening from Somalia. See, this is why I do it at early on Saturday morning because I figured people across the pond in Europe and the Middle East um, and, and even Asia could watch it because it's, um, it's late at night there. And then on the West Coast of the U.S., well, it's early in the morning. I don't know if Californians get up this early. You know, if they do, it's just to head over to Starbucks and have a latte. But <laughs> did I say that? Sorry. Um, anyway, so what do you think is going on? Any ideas? Well, I was very curious um, because it seemed to be <coughs> coming and going. And if you hadn't noticed, you know, remember I always sell, tell people when I, if you, if you, if you want to have a really terrific course in electrocardiography, uh, go to ecgacademy.com. There's a link in the bottom and you can start from scratch with the basics of anatomy physiology and learn how to read electrocardiograms from a physiologic standpoint, like an electrophysiologist looks at a cardiogram. And I always tell people, look at the whole forest. All right, don't just concentrate on the trees. Here you have trees in V1, V2, and they look, they look like they're on fire, right? It's a forest fire. Uh, but, but what about the rhythm strip? Look, look at lead two down here at the bottom. Notice I, I conveniently left that out. You have all these beats, and then, ah, uh, look at that. These three beats, actually four beats, look different than the rest. So something is happening intermittently. Vandanen from Cambodia. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. And Dek from Somalia, wow, Radislaw, wow, from Poland. This is so cool. Oh, you, have guys, you have guys have no idea how cool this is for me to be sitting here in, the, in New Jersey um, and, and speaking to people all over the world. It's just like unbelievable. Thank you. Anyway, so look, it, it changed. The QRS complex changed. Certainly in lead two, it changed. And then it changed back again. So this has to be a conduction problem. No, it's not electrolytes because, you know, that's what they go. Oh, let's check the, uh, you know, maybe it's hypokalemia. No, because that would affect the ECG sort of on a permanent basis. Is it maybe rate related? Not really. It, the rate doesn't change here. So it's not like, um, you know, a, a rate related bundle branch block or anything, but it is some kind of change in the conduction system that alters the QRS morphology. And um, remember, um, if, if the QRS depolarization sequence changes, then the repolarization is going to be affected. So, so I said, well, let, let's get the EKG department back. And I ran a complete rhythm strip. And let me show that to you. So here's a rhythm strip. And now you can see all 12 leads at once. And the first four beats here, let me make that a little bit bigger. Mm, well, okay, so anyway, you can see 10 leads at, anyway. The first four beats are these crazy looking weird things and you can see you know, in the V leads, look at V3 over here. Look at how elevated that is. This is what they were monitoring on the cardiogram in the, uh, op in the um, uh, recovery room. And so all of a sudden, it disappears. It changes back and forth between this weird-looking QS pattern with a ST elevation 
and then it goes back to normal. And then here's a single isolated beat that looks weird, and then they're normal again, and then it's back to... So this has to be a conduction problem. This has to be an anomaly of, of conduction that causes the left ventricle to depolarize in an abnormal fashion and, uh, and disturbs the, the QRS and the ST segment and the T wave altogether. So let's see. Why I thought it might have been a rate-related left bundle, um, but you know, when you look at V1 through V5 and 6, and, and even when you look at 1 and AVL, it does kind of have a left bundle-ish looking pattern to it. It's maybe not wide enough to be a complete left bundle, but certainly it does have that left bundle-y looking pattern to it. Um, look at even V5 and V6, it has notching. And so, but the rate doesn't change, does it? It's, it's not like you have a burst of a PAT or AFib or something and it gets wide. So this is a very odd kind of conduction anomaly that's intermittent. It's almost like a loose connection in the patient's left bundle branch system. Isn't that crazy? Nicola, why do these beats that are different in the rhythm strip correspond to beats in V1? Because, well, you know, in that 12 lead, what you were looking at is, is um, a sort of a real time, uh, so, so it records V1, V2, V3 for those three beats, and then it goes on to RLF for those three beats. So you're not looking at the same three beats in all 12 leads. You're only looking at it in real time. That's why the rhythm strip changes. The rhythm strip is kind of like the whole 10 seconds, and you can see changes in it from there. I know some ECG machines take three beats and display all 12 leads just for those three beats, so you can see, you know, from one lead to the next, but that's not how this machine works. Well, Ricardo had a very good idea, intermittent WPW. Now that, that you get extra points for that. That's, that's a 25 point bonus. So, so let's kind of go over that and try to figure out what it is. Cause what if you had an accessory pathway? Okay, so let, let's kind of like back up a little bit and, and talk about the conduction system and the kinds of things that, you know, we think about when the QRS gets wide. So um, if we have a wide QRS, we're talking about some sort of disturbance in the interventricular conduction in the ventricle. So normally we kind of think about um, aberrant conduction. So in other words, if um, uh, the most common reason for aberrant conduction has to do with refractory periods of the bundle branches. So if you look at the action potential, oops, let me make that a little bit darker. If you look at the action potential of, let's say the left bundle, so the Purkinje fibers tend to have relatively long um, action potential durations. So if this is the left bundle, and then you look at the right bundle, sometimes what happens is that the right bundle may actually have a slightly longer refractory period than the left bundle. And so if the AV node lets a beat down just at this moment, then what happens is the left bundle, oh, I have that wrong. See that? It's Saturday morning. Um, one of the bundles will have recovered. In this case, the left bundle branch will have recovered. Usually it's the right bundle. But one of the bundles has recovered and the other hasn't. And so you'll wind up, if the beat comes at this moment, that the green cell is able to fire, but the red cell is not. I normally get that right, but okay, so, um, okay. Kiwoo is still thinking he sees delta waves. Well, we're gonna see. Uh, Matilda, yeah, you made it, Woohoo! Excellent. So, okay, so the idea behind bundle branch blocks, um, functional, we call it functional bundle branch block, or usually rate related, 
is that one of the bundles recovers before the other. So if a beat lands right at this point, one bundle will conduct and the other won't. So in most cases, actually, I mislabel this, the right bundle recovers sooner, the left bundle is slightly longer. And so in most cases, what happens is that the right bundle branch blocks and the signal has to go down the left side, get to the ventricle, and then reach the right bundle through slow intramyocardial pathways. And so in lead one, let's say, you get the typical right bundle branch block pattern in V1, you get a big R prime. Okay, so, but here we have a left bundle problem and it's not rate related, it's just intermittent. So what we're seeing is that the left bundle branch is kind of either right at the margin of its refractory period. In other words, maybe the refractory period is at a, a, a rate of, of 70 and this is going at 71 beats per minute. It may be that simple that you get very slight changes in the P2P interval that you can't even measure. And it's also possible that her left bundle branch block just conducts intermittently because there's some disease there. But in her case, what's happening is you have this, you know, the idea is that it's going down the right bundle and, and the left side of the ventricle is slow. And we can see in that case, you know, V1, instead of having a septal R wave and a narrow QRS, has a QS pattern is very wide and bizarre. And then you have the secondary STT abnormalities that because when the sequence of depolarization is thrown off, your sequence of repolarization is. But here's the thing. I wondered about that WPW business. I wondered about whether there could be an accessory pathway someplace. So let's say if you have an accessory pathway on the right side that is intermittent and we know that accessory pathways can sometimes have a very long refractory period and they may conduct and sometimes they won't. That would kind of give you the same change in your QRS because now what happens is when this conduction occurs you have pre-excitation of the right ventricle. So the right ventricle now depolarized early and the left ventricle has to depolarize very slowly through intramyocardial pathways. And so what you get in V1 would be a, a kind of um, a negative delta wave with a short PR because you're pre-exciting the ventricle, right? And um, in lead one, because the this, this signal is heading towards the, the left side, you get generally, you get a short PR and a positive delta wave. So the question is, what's happening to the PR interval? Is the PR shortening? And is there a delta wave that occurs that starts the QRS early? Because in reality, what, you know, I'm, I'm doing the WPW uh, lessons in the advanced course right now. I started one, I have another one ready, almost ready to go. But the reason that what happens at WPW is that your PR interval shortens because your QRS is starting early. So here's where the normal QRS would be, right? So you have pre-excitation. That means the ventricle gets depolarized sooner than it should. So the QRS starts earlier, right there. That's known as a delta wave because you're not going down rapid Purkinje fibers. You're propagating through the ventricle s slowly and that's why it's a slurred upstroke of the QRS complex. I'm gonna, th now I'm giving away all my secrets that I was going to talk about in the advanced lecture. But uh, see, those of you who woke up early on a Saturday morning or, or stayed up late on a, on a Friday night, you, you're learning it here. So the, the reason that the delta wave is, is slurred is because you have slow conduction through the ventricle because this accessory pathway inserts near the AV groove. And so there's no Purkinje fibers out this way. You have very slow conduction. But the QRS starts earlier than it should. Normally the AV node would delay the signal. And that's why you get a PR segment. But here your ventricle is depolarizing rapidly. Now th the thing about right-sided pathways is they cause a kind of a left bundle branch block-ish looking pattern. 
right? Because the sequence of depolarization is the same as it would be in a left bundle branch block. Now, the thing about right-sided pathways is they are directly connected from the right atrium to the right ventricle in most cases. And usually the signal gets down very rapidly. So the PR interval is usually extremely short and conduction down, down right-sided accessory pathways is usually very rapid. So the delta waves are unmistakable. Let's go back to this ECG where you have that intermittent conduction and I did something really cool. I'm going to make this bigger and zoom in a little bit on, was it this one, this area? Where was the area? Maybe it was here. Um, okay. Now what I did was I grabbed this section of this ECG and let me turn that layer on now. Aha. Now I grabbed this ECG copied it and pasted it. See the miracles of Photoshop. I subtracted out the background and then I colored it red, but now I can drag it around. So I can drag it and show you something very, very cool. See now if I drag it, where am I dragging? Hello. Hold on a second. Let me take this. Make sure it, nope, I was dragging the wrong layer. Here we go. Aha! Oh, wow. Isn't that cool? I can kind of drag it all over the place. The cool thing, the reason I did this is because I wanted to superimpose it on this narrow beat here. And look at what I found. That if you superimpose the P waves and the narrow beats, you can see that the QRS complex actually starts on time. The QRS complex starts at the same point that it normally would. It's not starting early. You see that? Then what happens is the duration of the QRS extends. It becomes longer and it ends later. And, um, and so that tells you that it's not being pre-excited, but that conduction through the ventricle is being delayed. So that's why, I, that's why I was able to prove that this is not pre-excitation in the strictest sense, but rather this is aberrant conduction in the ventricles, kind of like a, right, kind of like a left bundle branch block, but it's just a little bit, you know, not quite as wide as it would be. So, you know, perhaps not the entire left bundle is affected, uh, or maybe there's just a little bit of delay in the left bundle. But this is how I was able to prove to myself that this isn't WPW. Um, so, so this was really cool. And I, and I basically reassured the lady that she didn't have any serious problems. I went back and I actually looked at the... Um, uh, I asked her about whether she had accessory... Whether she had tachycardia, whether she was getting palpitations or not, and she denied all that. So this is really kind of a cosmetic problem. It's a, it's nothing. It, you don't have to treat it at all in the absence of symptoms, and most of the time people won't have symptoms. Let me just take a look and see what we have here. Um, Kent lacks this capability. Well, that's what I'm saying is if you have a Kent bundle that connects directly ca connects the atria with the ventricles, you get premature excitation of the ventricles, so the QRS should start earlier. Now there are exceptions to that rule, and I don't want to get too deeply into it, but there are rare forms of pre-excitation. Uh, for example, you guys can go look up what a Maheim fiber is, and that's sort of an accessory pathway that conducts slowly, <coughs> kind of like the AV node. But you can't really prove it without doing a His bundle study and it's usually involved in tachycardia where you're going down this accessory pathway and up the AV node and you basically get a wide complex tachycardia with a left bundle branch block morphology. But when you do an EP study, you can see this kind of um, uh, intermittent aberrant conduction, but it's going down an accessory pathway. It's generally located on the right side. So that, I mean, it's possible that's what this is. Those of you who are 
doing, who are EP fellows, maybe you want to, you know, look up what a Maheim fiber is and how you prove it. But you can't really prove it without actually doing a His bundle because in a Maheim fiber, what happens is the, the um, HV is short and the H interval gets longer, but the, the QRS gets wider and the um, P wave to, to the onset of the QRS actually gets longer because it's a dec decremental conducting. It's a slow conducting kind of calcium dependent pathway. And that, that's like, really, I, I think I've only seen that once or twice in, in my 30 year career because I don't, I don't live in the EP lab. You know, some people, some guys are just doing EP studies and ablations all day long and they see it more often. But so that's, that's a very rare thing. But anyway, I do think that this is, um, let's see, David, could this be an accessory from the hist to right ventricle? Um, it, it, could be, um, but you'd, again, you'd expect to see the um, uh, QRS start a little early. Um, um, well, unless you have uh, delayed conduction in the AV node, so the, so the AH interval doesn't change. But that would be extremely rare, you know. And, and again, um, uh, the, 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 the fact that the QRS actually gets longer and ends later um, makes me think that it's more of, of delay below the his bundle and taking longer to get through the ventricle rather than it being sort of pre-excited as you're suggesting. But that's a good thought. So I, I do think that this was a really cool case and you know obviously the ST elevation was completely due to the, ex due to the conduction anomaly and the, those STT wave abnormalities are secondary to this interventricular conduction disturbance. And you can't always rely on that. I mean, you guys know, so not all ST elevation is a, a STEMI. Sometimes you can have pericarditis, you can even have early repolarization. But the fact that it was coming and going tells you that it's definitely not ischemia. So I thought that was, this was like a really cool case. And, um, and uh, I, I do think that um, these these Saturday morning things are fun. So I hope you guys are enjoying um, peering into my brain. That's <laughs> you can see inside. You see that it's a it's a gyrus. You know, oh, well <laughs> now you can see a little bit more of my wacky personality. But um, thanks for joining me on this Saturday morning. I really appreciate all of you who uh, were able to get up early or stay up late and join me. And again, don't forget to uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, ECG Doc. That's a really great way of knowing ahead of time whether I'm going to be doing this on a Saturday morning. Because if I'm on call or something else is going on, I don't do it, but I try to do it every week. And again, if you uh, want to share it with your friends, let them know that I'm doing this, um, it would be great. I'd love to have uh, as many people join as, as possible. If you want to watch this after the fact, if you're watching it after the fact, then I hope you enjoy it. Please leave some positive comments. And um, again, subscribe to my channel. Thanks. Thanks very much. And I hope you have a terrific day. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can always uh, you know, leave some comments down uh, below this uh, uh, video. Have a great day and uh, see you next time.